All right. Thank you all for being here, whether you're here with us on the on this Zoom recording or practicing with us after on YouTube. We uh, I hope you feel a sense of connection, you know, as much as possible wherever you are. Hmm. So the the theme tonight is uh uh, uh, came about because this morning, as I was getting ready to go out to teach with an in-person sangha, uh, meaning community, I was in the front hall reaching for my coat, putting a coat on, and then I, I thought, oh, I wonder how cold it is. And my first instinct, I could feel the urge. I just started to kind of reach or wonder where it was and stop myself because my first instinct was to reach for the phone for it to tell me how cold I was, it was. And the door was closer than the phone. <laughs> I was like, hmm, honey, why don't you just open the door like in the olden days and just feel what the temperature is. And I was so... <sighs> It just woke me up, that moment of this uh, really compulsion, habit, addiction, uh, to get the phone telling me what the temperature is. And it felt so refreshing just to open the door and stick my head out and go, oh, it's cold. It's actually pretty cold. I'm going to put this on. And, uh, but I could feel that habit of just look at the weather app on my phone and uh so last night I started a new course a training program that I'm undertaking to become a death doula meaning like a midwife for dying the same as we may have for birthing uh, to accompany people in their dying time and and in diagnosis and various stages of that process. And in this course last night, our teacher, Carrie Sawatsky, who is a, a amazing teacher from modern death care, uh, was talking about her morning practice of getting not turning her phone on first thing not reaching for the phone first thing which i have been doing and just getting up having tea sitting um and so i'm sitting with a sun lamp to help with the seasonal affective depression that can come in this gray time and doing some journaling, writing some intentions, and um, practicing meditation, um, and then turning the phone on after that, if needed. Uh, and so th that's really been revealing uh, to just start to, to break this ha habit. Um, and it feels so fulfilling to really slow down the morning, slow down the input, and and cultivate what I really want to bring into my day. Uh, another thing that happened today is I've been reflecting with this addiction. Uh, there was beautiful ice coating all, all the branches on my drive. Uh, it was it was so so pretty, <laughs> and uh, um, I notice when things are pretty or beautiful in nature. I want the the one I want to take a picture. This this um, feeling of wanting to capture it, and I remember being on a walk with a friend and we were somewhere beautiful and we're you know we were saying oh wouldn't it be oh, too bad we didn't have our phones so we could take a picture 
And she shared how someone had offered that teaching to her and said, just take a picture with your mind, with your eyes, with your awareness to really pay attention, to really, um, you know, not that we can hold on to it in memory because we know memory is selective, um, but to really rest in the presence of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, all these sense doors without trying to just quickly capture it for what purpose? Often to share with others or to, um, you know, post on social media or et cetera. And so, um, you know, just noticing that instinct to want to, again, use this device in that way instead of just resting in the beauty, in the joy, in the present moment awareness of it. A few weeks back, we practiced here together and, and uh, offered some teachings on renunciation, which is a very important part of meditation and, and the path. It's part of wise intention. And uh, In that talk, so um, in the YouTube recording here down below, I'll put a link to that talk. If you want to explore more about renunciation, please do. It's very important. Uh, but in that talk, I mentioned, cited how Joseph Goldstein has referred to renunciation as non-addiction. And of course, what I'm talking about tonight is phone addiction. Um, but it can, you know, it could be social media addiction or whatever um, device uh, you may find that you're kind of hooked on, as I am. Um, another way I've practiced with this is, <laughs> you know, how these devices are like an instant encyclopedia that I, I've watched in myself how much I want, when I don't know something, Google it. Like right away, I want to know. I want to know the answer, no matter how mundane it is, no matter that I'm going to forget it. It's not like something really important that I'm going to be studying or really integrating. It's just like, yeah, how many people live there or what, you know, whatever. We could go on and on about all the mundane facts and trivia that, and and so just to feel how strong that is, like, I want to know, like, right away. And to explore, practicing with, like, hmm, not knowing. Do you remember how we used to, like, not know? I used to sound like such an, uh, an elder proud to be an elder of like remember when but uh you sometimes just didn't know a thing and that used to be okay last week our talk here and our practice was on not knowing no you know what do we do know and what what's it like to be in that beginner's mind place of not knowing and waking up to just like curiosity like I don't know. And just be there with curiosity. Um, it's it's a pretty strong pull. I, I invite your curiosity with that and see if if it is for you. It is for me. And check it out for yourself how that is for you. Um <laughs> I was doing a little bit of um, reading on, I, I won't go into it because I'm sure you know, and and it's it's not so relevant, but there's lots of 
lots of research and posts and stuff about the harm, uh, how much we're actually using our phones the, or, or devices. I'll just keep saying phones. But um, most people are very surprised if you put a monitor on your phone or an app where you're another app where you're tracking that, most people really underestimate how many hours a day they're using that. And there's lots of research on the harmful effects of this addiction. Um, in fact, there's a, now they have the, I think it's the National Health Service, the NHS has um, launched its first internet addiction clinic wow that we need that and we certainly do um so that to me just says a lot uh there's a mindfulness teacher dr chris lee that <laughs> says this fact people who say they don't have time for mindfulness poop with their phones if you don't have three to five minutes to breathe while you do the do you need one to, one of, of three things, fiber, Jesus, or breath. <laughs> do you actually even poop with your phone? Like we can't even do that mindfully or just with presence? Or, oh, all the ways. Not going to go into it. Yeah, and another thing I was re reflecting on is like, I've never had um, a TV in my bedroom. Um, no, that's a hard no. And yet I've been taking my phone into the bedroom. It's like, well, it's just a little TV, isn't it? So um, I've set up a special little table with a salt and crystal lamp out in the dining room that's going to be like, the phone resting place. Good night, sweetheart. Rest. <laughs> Just plug it in there. It's not to mention the electromagnetic radiation of having it beside my head all night, which, you know, that's another story. So I've made a little shrine for the phone, make it a special place, put some nice things there. I might put a little something from my altar there to um, help me ritualize or make that uh, a, a really clear intention. Uh, one more quote here. Um, this is from Melissa Stussy, S-T-E-U-S-S-Y, who said uh, this about our phones and the interference with our connection with each other. Um, she said, we owe ourselves and our loved ones eye contact and connection. I think many of us are emotionally dying from disconnection in a so-called connected world. You know, we're supposed to be so more interconnected with these devices. Yet we have everything we could ever want to know at our fingertips but we're missing out on the joy juice, in quotes, she calls it the joy juice or oxytocin that comes from personal heartfelt interaction. The joy juice. Um, so all that being said, there's skillful and unskillful ways to be with anything in our life. And so, you know, if you're here on your phone to practice meditation <laughs> of course that's like so skillful <laughs> so wonderful so appreciated um but it's just an exploration of what is really happening for you and maybe it's a totally different experience for you the real practice for me with this addiction I am just thinking of someone else, a relative who's um, also working with this phone addiction. And well, 
the whole social media addiction because she's a big you know tons of instagram followers and all that stuff and is having a break from it right now um so the real practice here i think is regarding the hindrances the hindrances are um five particular experiences that the buddha taught all meditators experience all practitioners even if you're not meditating you're experiencing these things in your life and it's really those hindrances that are causing me to reach for the phone um desire is the first one so you know it seems obvious I don't need to say much about that right like all the shopping that happens uh, on a phone or scrolling through beautiful people, um, whatever, that feeding that desire or the desire to you know, play a game or something. Um, the aversion is is the next hindrance, which so it could be that, um like what's happening in the moment before you reach for the phone is there wanting something other than this present moment or is there aversion to this present moment like i'm actually feeling mm, frustrated or angry or disappointed and so we we reach for that to fill in also aversion might be fueling what we're doing on the phone you know if we're like doom scrolling or if we're um posting reactions to people's stuff that's in unskillful language the so there's desire and aversion the third um of these five hindrances is called restlessness and remorse this is the sensations in the body and the states in the mind that are like anxious, stressed, um, tense, jittery, or states of worry in the mind. So forward thinking and past thinking states where we're going over something that's already happened and oh why did it go that way and why am I this way mostly why are they that way and going over it and over it this is remorse and restlessness is kind of a future thinking of like planning mind and the to-do list mind and the wanting um projections and these states also may be arising and cause us to reach for the phone to to soothe that savage beast the fourth grouping of hindrance is called sloth and torpor this is physical and mental lethargy it can be just physical tiredness and you know this is like I know that if I stay up too late, I'll start eating. It's not because I'm hungry. It's because I'm tired and I'm eating to help me stay awake. And similarly, maybe we're really tired. And instead of resting, we reach for the phone and stimulate ourselves that way. <clears throat> so it could be physical tiredness or mental, emotional, energetic tiredness, torpor, where there's just a dullness, a um a lack of curiosity a lack of brightness and rather than feeling that and attending to it skillfully we reach for this device to um entertain us and the last of these five hindrances is doubt this can show up in lots of different ways but maybe in this context it may be doubt 
self-doubt, right? That, you know, doubting our our capability to accomplish something else or be productive in something else or doubting our ability to just be with this discomfort that can show, you know, be showing up in all these different ways. And that may cause us to reach for the phone. I, I was making myself a little list today of, you know, just some, this is just some of the things that the phone is kind of replacing in my life. So first of all, a phone, like the old school one with the, yeah, a phone. Um, dogs are scrambling. So a cal calendar, a camera, coloring book, a coloring app on there, a game board, um, clock, a watch, meal planner, um, instead of sending thank you cards, it might shoot a quick message thanking somebody for something. It's replacing my, you know, really checking in with a friend or family or dear one or student, um, you know, in some other way that feels more connected. Uh, a travel guidebook, a GPS, a fitness trainer, shopping list, recipe books, alarm clock perhaps a TV for some people, books, like actual books, <laughs> um, bank, shopping mall, star constellation finder, I have that on there too, um, calculator, language tutor, currently learning Spanish. So you can see that some of these things are skillful. Um, it might be your Meditation teacher might be on your phone, like your, you know, guided meditations or listening to Dharma talks. So I'm not saying that everything about phones is bad, quote unquote. I'm not saying any of it's bad. I'm saying, check it out. What's going on? What's really happening? So we're going to practice tonight with building our tolerance to actually feel the hindrances. Let ourselves feel bored <laughs> and be skillful with it. Let ourselves feel restlessness. What's it actually feel like? How can I be skillful and present with it? Let myself feel desire. I would like this to end now and actually practice being skillful with it. So enough talking. Let's practice, yes. So adjust your posture that will support your practice of awakening, but also kindness. So uh, see what supports you need for your body to be comfortable and wakeful. You can practice laying down, and if you, um, depending what time you're practicing in, uh, you might like to raise up your forearm or bend your knees so that they'll move if you're falling asleep and you can begin again. You might like to turn away from the computer or dim your lights. See if you need any cushions or shawls, etc. And as you're arriving into your posture, see what helps you to arrive. So depending on your nervous system and how your heart, body, mind is in this moment, it might be helpful to Look around your space, turning our head can help um, release our nervous system. You might want some movement or stretching or touch. So see what helps you to come to a sense of arriving. 
meeting yourself in this present moment. Some people find it supportive to practice with the eyes slightly open, receiving a bit of light, seeing the space you're in. Some like to have the eyes resting on an object of beauty or peace in their space, or just having the eyes resting downward not looking for stimulation and entertainment, just resting the eyes. Others might find it helpful to rest the eyes all the way down, closed. So you can check out those different eye postures and see what's helpful for you. And then we're going to take several minutes here to just let ourselves land. So you could feel into the area of the face and see if there's any tension here that isn't needed in this present moment. And then feeling into the area of the neck and across the shoulders and inviting the weight of the shoulder bones to slide down as the neck lengthens. The weight of the shoulders sliding down through elbows and into resting hands. Hands that are in a posture of letting go or receiving, inviting some softness in the hands. And feeling into the area of the center of the chest and center of the belly. Is it helpful to you in this moment to invite some degree of softness here? As the upper body perhaps lets go or softens, widens, we might begin to feel now more weightedness through the hips, pelvis, legs and feet. Feeling the sensations that are here, that without looking or moving, we can feel the support that we're on, we can feel that contact, that pressure. Resting into the support that's here.
And then in order to be curious with these hindrances as they arise and pass, it's helpful for us to have an anchor that becomes a canvas on which we can see these things being drawn or painted on that canvas of awareness. And so I'll offer two anchors and you choose the one that's most supportive for you tonight. So one anchor may be the sensation of your hands. Let's all check that out together. Wherever your hands are resting, just awakening to any sensations that are known. Maybe temperature, texture. Sensations of touch of the other hand or on the legs or the touch of air. And there may be sensations of tingling or pulse or flow. Take a few moments here just to become very curious, like that beginner's mind from last week. What does this area we call hands actually feel like? And now you can continue either with hands as the canvas or the anchor for your attention, which means the place we return to when we begin again. Or you could choose the breath as your anchor. Not following the breath all the way into and out of the body, but just choosing one place in the body where you feel the sensation are breathing most easily. Maybe it's the belly, contracting, expanding, or the chest rising and falling. Or the touch of breath at the nostrils. So just choosing one of those places that feels most accessible to you. And let's check that out for a little while. So now we'll all choose that one anchor, one place of breath, or the sensation of hands. And then we'll just stay with that for the remainder of this practice, or stay returning to that, I should say. Settle in now on your anchor, with your anchor.
And unless you already have a pretty strong concentration practice, you might have noticed by now, just in those few minutes, that awareness moved away from your anchor. And when that's noticed, we gently begin again. The next time attention moves from your anchor and is noticed, before you begin again, bring some curiosity to where was the attention? Was there some aversion, thoughts of not wanting something or aversion to someone? Was there desire, wanting something else? Was there restlessness or sleepiness? Just a few moments, seeing if you can notice what was there and then begin again. Now, more important than trying to name what the hindrance was or the where the attention was, is to feel the sensation of it. Was there a sensation of numbness? Was there a sensation of abandoning yourself in the present moment and being elsewhere? What does that feel like? If there's restlessness, what does it actually feel like? Where do you feel it? If there's wanting, desire, how do you know? Where do you feel it? Is there contraction somewhere? Let's check that out together.
If you weren't meditating and your phone was nearby, would you have reached for your phone by now? Begin again. And in these last five minutes of practice, continue with this curiosity, this beginning again, but also notice the times of the absence of hindrances, of moments when there's just resting with the sensation of hands or sensation of breath. And there's nothing else pulling awareness away. Very important to acknowledge that and feel what does that feel like.
Well, if you've joined us here on the recording, thank you for practicing with us. And um, there's also links if you're curious to, I just gave a really just a listing of, of those hindrances, but there's a talk on each one of these hindrances on the YouTube channel. I'll list them in the description down below, and then you can search um, to practice with and explore each one of these hindrances. <clears throat> and uh, um, good luck with your renunciation and practice of non-addiction. Um, I wish you courage and curiosity with it rather than good luck. Good luck is kind of weird. <laughs> good luck. So uh, see you next week if you're joining us then.